Welcome back. So for this lecture, we're going to dive a little bit more into the phonetics aspect of linguistic structure and talk about the International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, if you haven't yet gotten your handouts, you should probably have those handy. Um, looking through the handout for the International Phonetic Alphabet, the IPA will be really helpful as we're going through some of this material. So when we talk about what phonetics is, as we mentioned in the last lecture, this is the scientific study of speech sounds, and it's broken into three different branches or fields of study. So the acoustic, the sound form itself, the auditory, how we perceive sounds, and then the articulatory, or how we produce sounds, which is going to be what we focus on. Um, this is going to be helpful for analyses where we don't have recordings of spoken language. We can't really do acoustic or auditory analysis for this class, but we can look at how sounds are produced and where they're produced and what sounds would have existed um, in different forms of English. So when we're focusing on the articulatory branch, we'll start with consonants and look at how we actually produce consonants. And we'll start by looking at different places of articulation. So when we're thinking about how we're articulating sounds, we describe sounds with three different terms. So we have voicing, which takes place in the larynx. So do your vocal folds vibrate or not? So sounds can either be voiced if you're vibrating your vocal folds or unvoiced if they're relaxed and not vibrating place, which is where the sound is made in your vocal tract. So if we think about areas from our lips down into our throat, any of those different places along the oral tract is going to be the kinds of places that we're concerned with for that. Um, and based on what is it we call an active and a passive articulator, where an active articulator is what's moving to make the sound, the passive articulator is what's staying in place where the moving portion is sort of moving towards that area. <clears throat> and then finally, the manner where sort of how the sound is produced, and more specifically, how much restriction we have in the vocal tract when we're making particular sounds. So if we start by looking at the entire system, it's a little bit of an anatomy lesson today. We'll start with our subglottal system. So this is the area that is below your larynx. This involves your lungs and your trachea or your windpipe. And there, this is a very important aspect for how we make sounds. So our subglottal system containing our lungs gives us the airflow we need in order to produce sounds. And then we need our trachea as well to funnel that airflow towards our larynx, so towards our vocal folds, and into our oral cavity where most of our differences in sounds are made. We do actually have a few sounds in English that are made entirely within the subglottal system. One that we've had for a long time, another one that's relatively new. We have our H sound, um, so the H huh sound is made in our glottal area. And then we also have a sound that's known as a glottal stop. And this is sort of like an absence of sound. So we're closing our glottis to restrict the airflow very briefly, and then we're releasing it again. And so when we think about what words might have this, in present day English, words like uh-oh, that little pause between the two, or Hawaii, or in a lot of dialects of English, we see this in place of T. So in a word like mitten or kitten, instead of pronouncing the T itself, we're using a glottal stop in its place. So some of those sounds are just happening all the way down in our glottal system, and we're not even using our oral tract to make some of those sounds. For the next area that's important, our larynx. Our larynx is where our vocal folds are vibrated. And this is playing an important role because one of those three descriptions we have for consonant sounds is voicing, and the larynx is what controls that voicing entirely. So if our vocal folds vibrate back and forth, then we have a voiced sound, something that we would call voiced. If they're relaxed and open and letting just the air flow through without vibrating, this would be an unvoiced or a voiceless sound. And whether or not they're vibrating is what we call voicing. So we can do a little experiment where you can hold your hand to your throat, and then if you make an S sound, you may notice that you don't feel any vibration on your fingers when you're holding them against your throat. But if you make a Z sound, Z, you can feel that vibration happening between the Z, but not happening with the S. And the only difference in those sounds is whether or not we're vibrating that vocal fold. You may have noticed your mouth didn't move between S and Z because it's made in the same place, it's made in the same manner. The only distinction between those sounds is if they're voiced or if they're not voiced. And most of our sounds, most of the distinctions that we make in our sounds, both consonants and vowels, although we'll focus on vowels first, or consonants first, is happening in our vocal tract. So everything above the larynx is sometimes called the supralaryngeal or supraglottal system. You'll usually just hear me say vocal tract or oral tract. And this contains most of what we actually manipulate in speech. And so the parts of the vocal tract that are used to make a sound are what we would call the place of articulation for a particular sound. 
So we've already talked about voicing. We'll look now at place. So if we look at a drawing of a vocal tract, you see a lot of different labels. There's a lot of different terms for these different places. So if you're not familiar with them, then it may be a little bit more of a learning curve here because we do have a lot of terminology that comes with this section. So we'll, st we'll have things as far forward as our lips, as far down as into our pharynx, further back in the throat, depending on the language. In English, aside from our glottal sounds, we don't go any further back than the velum. And we'll talk about what those different places are in just a moment. But first, thinking about our articulators is going to be important. So I briefly mentioned active and passive articulators already. And most consonant sounds will involve an active articulator and a passive articulator. So if we have a sound like an F or a V, our active articulator would be our lip. Our bottom lip is moving up to our teeth. And then our teeth would be the passive articulator. They're not moving, they're just standing still, but the lips are moving up to them in order to make that sound. And so for most sounds, the tongue is going to be the active articulator um, with the place being described as where the passive articulator is. For labial sounds, anything that involves your lips, your lips would be the active articulator. So the way that we can describe them is based on the kinds of articulators that we have. And the places that we have in English, the ones that you'll need to be familiar with and understand from the front of the mouth towards the back are bilabial sounds, which are using both of your lips together. So a P or a B sound would be examples of those. Our labiodental sounds, so labio meaning lips, dental meaning teeth, so our F and our V sounds. Interdental sounds are sometimes just labeled dental sounds. In English, we have a few of them. That's our TH sound, so TH or TH would be examples of them where you're sort of sticking your tongue in between your teeth in order to make those sounds. Our alveolar sounds, there's a lot of these in languages of the world and many in English as well, where you're sticking your tongue towards the alveolar ridge, which is the area of your gums right behind where your teeth enter your gums. So that hard spot right behind where your teeth go up into your gums is the alveolar ridge and that would be the place for that. We have our post-alveolar, or sometimes called alveopalatal area, which is just a little bit further behind the alveolar ridge. It doesn't really have its own identity, but it's further back behind the alveolar ridge, but not quite all the way to the top of your hard palate. And then we have our palatal sounds. Palatal sounds are made by moving the base of your tongue up towards the hard palate, the top, the roof of your mouth. And then we have velar sounds, where the base of your tongue is sort of moving back a little bit towards your velum. So it's moving towards the back of your, your throat. So a K or a G sound, K, G. You can kind of feel your tongue moving a little bit back as you're making those different sounds. And then finally, those glottal sounds that we've already mentioned. <clears throat> and then the third aspect of describing consonants is manners of articulation. So this is going to be in addition to the voicing that we've talked about, in addition to the place, so the location of a sound. Manner is going to be really important in describing what makes them different if you have the same voicing or you have the same place. Manner is going to be that other feature that can make distinctions. And this is referring to how much restriction we have in the vocal tract when we're making a sound. And there's a lot of different manners that we have in different languages of the world. The ones that we have in English that you'll need to be responsible for are nasal. So these are sounds like M and N. So these are sounds where you're closing your mouth completely and the air is escaping through your nasal cavity instead. So with an mmm sound, it's a bilabial sound. You're closing your mouth at your lips, and then you're letting the air flow through your nose instead. With an N sound, this one is an alveolar sound. You're sticking your tongue up against the alveolar ridge, mmm, and then closing off the air from your mouth and having that air escape through your nose instead. We also have plosives. Your book calls them stops. Um, so plosives are sounds that have a closure and a release phase where the release phase is where you're actually hearing the sound. So things like P and B and T and D, P, B, T, D, depending on the place, depending on the voicing makes them sound different, but you're closing off the air completely and then you're releasing it. And it's that release that makes that plosive. So you can sort of think plosive explosion or stop where you're stopping the air and then releasing it. We do have a flap that is also found in English. This one is an alveolar flap that we have in English. Um, it's similar to the Spanish R sound, but it's kind of like a T or a D. Oftentimes it kind of sounds like a D to us. But rather than saying duh and actually sticking your tongue up, holding it there, and then releasing the air, with a flap you're just flapping your tongue up really quickly against the alveolar ridge and then dropping it back down. So in a word like ladder, butter, 
where you're not really making a butter sound or ladder. You're not making the full consonant sound, the full plosive. You're just throwing your tongue up very quickly and then dropping it back down. Fricatives are sounds where you're almost closing your mouth completely, but not quite. And so you're hearing a lot of friction instead. So these are sounds like s or s or th, where you can kind of feel and hear that friction happening in order to make that sound. So your articulators are very close together, but they're not quite touching. And that's what gives you that sound that you're hearing. We have affricates, which is actually a combination of two different sounds. It would be a plosive and a fricative together. In English, we have two of them. We have ch, which is a t and a sh sound squished together. And we have j, which is a d and a j sound squished together. And then we have approximants. And approximants are sort of approximately happening in certain areas of your mouth. They're more open than other consonants. And so you're sort of approximating a shape in your mouth where you have central um, sounds that are escaping through the middle of your mouth or lateral sounds. So central sounds would be like an er, an r sound, a w sound. A lateral sound would be like our l sound where the air is actually escaping out of the side of your mouth. And these same approximants can also be described as either being liquids or glides. So our r and our l sounds are liquid sounds and then our w and our y sounds would be glide sounds. So those are the main features that we have, the different kinds of place, the different kinds of manner, the different kinds of voicing. And these are going to be very important because this is how we describe consonant sounds. So when we're looking at the IPA handout, when we're looking at those symbols, we're describing those symbols as well as the sound that's being made based on voicing. So is it voiced or voiceless? Based on place, so where those articulators are, and then based on manner, so how much restriction there is. And that's how we usually order them in linguistics. You might be able to use them in any order, but typically it's just sort of standardized that you'll see them usually listed voicing first and then place and then manner. So a B sound, a B sound would be a voiced bilabial stop. An S sound would be a voiceless alveolar fricative. And those would be ways that we can describe consonants and that we can look at the chart and look at the IPA symbols and be able to match those different features with the symbol so that we know what sound is made consistently. So if you have your handout, get them out. Um, you have a special handout that's specifically designed for the sounds that you'll need to be familiar with in this class. You can also look up the full IPA handout, um, and I think I did post that on Blackboard for you as well, where you'll see lots and lots and lots of other symbols that we won't really need or won't really see in this class. So I've left them out of the handout that you should focus on because it can just get messy if you're looking at sounds that we don't actually have um, in English or in anything we're looking at. So when we're looking at the International Phonetic Alphabet, the reason this is helpful is because it's going to give you symbols to represent sounds with a one-for-one -one correspondence. It's going to make you familiar with this symbol means this sound every single time, regardless of spelling, regardless of what language you're looking at, regardless of what form of English we might be looking at, we'll be able to become aware of what sound is taking place based on what the IPA symbol is. And a lot of them are going to look familiar to us as English speakers. This was created by French and English speaking linguists. So a lot of times the symbols will look similar to our spelling, but don't necessarily match with how we use them in our spelling. So some of them will be very different. So our TH sounds are represented with symbols that are different. So we have a voiceless one, which looks like theta. Um, so the th sound would have a theta symbol. And then we have an ev symbol. It kind of looks like a sideways D with a dash through the top. That would be our voiced one, so the and the. And then we also have a symbol that looks like our lowercase j, but this is actually our y sound. So the y in yellow is represented by the IPA symbol that looks like a letter j. And you need to be careful with some of these. So the j refers to sounds that we might often spell with a y, but the lowercase y refers to a sound that we used to have in English that we no longer have. It's actually a vowel sound. So that u sound is something that represents differently than that y sound. And there's a few others that we'll be able to see and we'll be able to discuss as we go through them and as we dive more into um, different areas of phonetics as we move along. So this is what the consonant chart looks like on your chart. The boxes show you all of the different sounds that we have or have had in English over time and the ones that you should be familiar with because they'll show up. So some of them, like the bilabial fricative, the w sound, 
we don't have in English, but we used to have in previous forms of English as we look at the development, so it's on the chart. Same with the velar fricatives, things like ch and r. We don't have those in English any longer, but we used to have them, so they're listed on your chart so that you're familiar with them as we see them in other areas of English. And then if we look at the vowels, the vowels also have a sim set of symbols that go with them. And when we think about vowels, there's a lot more fluidity for how vowels are really discussed and how they're taking place in your mouth. So the IPA system has symbols for vowels, and you'll see that you have a more limited choice of vowels on your chart um, than what you see in a full IPA chart, which can get a lot more messy. So vowels are relatively unobstructed in our mouth because we're moving our entire mouths differently to produce these vowels, but we have a lot of freedom of movement for them. So rather than having very specific descriptions like with the consonants, we tend to talk about sort of the general area in our mouth that these are taking place. So we have individual symbols that are represented and these are based on where they're sort of taking place. But one thing that you'll notice is that our IPA vowel symbols look a lot like English letters, but our modern pronunciation differs a lot from what you think of. It used to match our previous forms, so the vowels will be a little bit easier in, say, Old English than in Modern English when we're looking at them in the IPA. But you want to be careful of recognizing that a sound and a symbol doesn't necessarily match up with how we spell them in Modern Day English. When we're describing vowels, we have a few other ways of describing them. So when, rather than using voicing, place, and manner, we're instead going to talk about them based on sort of where in the mouth they're taking place. So we use backness, so how far back or forward in the mouth it is. Height, so how far up or low in the mouth it is. Tenseness, which refers to how tense you're making your jaw. This is not a distinction that has always existed in English, but something that's useful for us now. And then rounding, whether or not you're rounding your lips or your lips are more flat. And so these are just general descriptions that give you an area of the mouth rather than a specific more pinpointed thing like what you might find with a consonant. So if you look at the vowel chart for English, you'll notice that there are several of them listed and that there's different descriptions for them. So on the top, you see front, central, and back, and that's referring to backness. So it's either going to be a front vowel taking place near the front of your mouth, a central vowel happening sort of in the middle of your mouth, or a back vowel where you're moving your tongue a little further back in the mouth to make those sounds. On the left, you see high, mid, and low. So the high vowels are vowels where you're lifting your tongue up and you're making the sound at the top of your mouth. The mid vowels are sort of, if you were just to open your mouth without moving it up or down, those are where the mid vowels are coming out. And then the low vowels, where you're actually lowering your jaw a little bit to make those sounds. So the sounds like ah and ah, you can actually feel your jaw drop a little bit while you're making them. The ones that are in the white area on the outside are our tense vowels, so a sound like E or A, you might feel your jaw tense more when you're making them, versus the lax ones where you're not tensing your mouth, so an I or an E sound feels more relaxed when you're making them. And then in addition to these individual vowels, we'll also over time through the semester start seeing how vowels can combine, similar to what we talked about affricates, which we have two con consonants combined, vowels can do the same thing. And so when we put those together, these are called diphthongs. And these are much less common in Old English. There's not very many of them, but they've become more and more common in English over time, and they'll change from dialect to dialect. So as we get closer and as we see them change, we'll talk more about those and what those actually entail. So that gives you a good overview of just phonetics broadly, what the terms are and how to use them, what the chart looks like, and then we'll be able to practice some in class to sort of get used to using that chart and ask questions in real time. But if you do have questions that have come up from this or from the book, you can email me, you can schedule office hours, and I highly encourage you again to bring questions to our synchronous class so we can discuss them together as a group.